thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Every once in a while, I come across something that I think is sort of bordering on what I would call the astonishing. Many of us go through life, and each and every one of us actually get have the opportunity to where we suffer loss. And I say opportunity, and people say, well, what's the opportunity got to do with loss? Well, the opportunity is that you have the opportunity to grow, I suppose. You could call it that. But what if uh, through societal patterning we never get that opportunity to, first of all, grieve properly so that we can actually release the pain that we experience when we have that loss? Generally, throughout the course of the Beyond 50 radio program, we've actually approached this subject, but it usually has to do with loss, for instance, a passing of a loved one, the death of a family, a death of a friend, or a death of a relative. And we wonder whether or not we ever get a chance to heal from something like that. But what about loss in general? And I started thinking about this as I began to read the Grief Recovery Handbook. And I'll have to say that this is going to be one of the most interesting shows that I think we've done on this subject yet. And I'd like to uh, welcome the author, or at least the co-author of the Grief Recovery Handbook, who's going to be joining us today, uh, who spent more than 30 years helping people get through grief recovery for their losses, regardless of what they are. Now think about this. Loss of a job, loss of a child, for instance, loss of a girlfriend, a first love, maybe the loss of a financial empire that you started and it just disappeared overnight. Look at the people that are losing their jobs and their incomes during this tumultuous economic time. So I'd like to welcome to our program today the Grief Recovery Handbook's co-author, John W. James, joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. And, John, thank you for being on the program with us today. Well, Daniel, let's turn that around. Thank you for (laughs) having the courage to have the topic on the air. You bet. You know, I've got to tell you, it was funny. I looked at this book. It was very unassuming. It's not a a huge thing here. But I, you know... I just started to read yesterday for the very first time, and I think I got more than three quarters of the book, so I'm actually getting to past part two where you actually have to do the work. And I never thought about the idea that when you lose or you you suffer a loss, regardless of what it is, that if you don't grieve over it properly and recover from it, that you could set up patterns and blocks that could actually stretch into so many areas of your life and I was just astonished by what I was reading and experiencing as I was reading the book. Let's talk about how you came to recover this, because I can understand this is like the 20th anniversary expanded edition of this book. Well, it's actually the fourth edition. Fourth uh, edition, okay. And it just happens to be the 20th anniversary. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. The the original book I wrote in, uh, I think it was 1984, 85, and self-published. And, uh, of course, I thought, you know, very few people would be interested. And so what actually happened was we sold 9,000 copies in about six weeks, and I was no longer able to help grievers, but I had a really great relationship with the UPS driver. (laughs) (laughs) So so that uh, encouraged us to go find a legitimate publisher, which turned out to be HarperCollins, which at that time was called Harper & Row. And so they printed the the second edition, and then there was ten years later a third edition, and then now this is the the twentieth anniversary edition. And it, it's really interesting. Grief is like the big hidden issue in in our society. Mm-hmm. And and normally what we do is we associate the word grief with the experience of death, mm-hmm. which is of course accurate. But it's only one of about 45 losses that a person can experience in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And if we do not have the correct information to grieve and complete the emotional aspect of loss, then instead of being – let's let's back up. We are designed to be processing units of emotion – we breathe in, we breathe out. We experience happiness and we laugh. We experience sadness and we cry. And that's the normal way. And then somewhere along the line, usually about age 5 through 10, we begin to teach people to start becoming trash compactors <laughs> rather yeah. than processing units. Mm-hmm. I mean, we tell people, uh, uh, well, the first loss I ever had was the death of a pet. And 
you know, my parents were, you know, normal, ordinary, everyday parents, and they did the best they could. And, and what they said to me was, oh, don't feel bad. On Saturday, we'll get you another dog. Right. Well, <clears throat> what you learn is what you practice, you know, and what you practice is what you get good at. And so what they had just taught me, although they didn't know it, was to bury sad emotion and to replace the loss. And then when you stop and think about how many times you practice that, you know, in your lifetime, uh, I mean, like in grade three, uh, I studied hard to get an A on this big history test, and instead I got a B. And so my parents, you know, I was unhappy and sad. And my parents said, oh, don't feel bad. You'll do better next time. And, right. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, uh, it, it's it's an amazing thing. Uh and we just it, well, here's the real issue: where grieving people are concerned, no matter what the loss is, lack of courage is not the problem. It's lack of knowledge mm-hmm. on what to do. I mean, uh, and I'm talking too much. I'm sorry. Uh, no, please. Well, it, let's say in your lifetime, uh, and interestingly, you called it societal patterning which is, you know, value system, belief system, it's all those are accurate. But let's say in your childhood you were introduced to and only taught about hammers and saws. Well, in in a lot of circumstances a hammer and a saw would would be sufficient to achieve the goal. But what if all of a sudden circumstances came up and you were required to paint a wall blue? Mm-hmm. but you can only use the information you have. So now, <laughs> here you are trying to paint the wall using a saw and a hammer. Well, it's not going to work. And that's the same thing with the with the myths, the, the misinformation that we commonly teach people as they're growing up. Uh, you know, bury your feelings or don't feel bad. Uh, just as an example, uh, between age 4 and age 15 – during the most, the eleven most in, uh, kind of informative years, a normal child in North America receives over twenty-three thousand reinforcements that showing and expressing sadness is not okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, and I don't want to keep hammering on this, but uh, if you can remember back to your first, you know, girlfriend, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, we're talking love here, you know. Right, <laughs> and, then, and I think you were about the same age that I was in your scenario. Oh, and I, you know, I mean, <laughs> my gosh, the, the the grass was green, the sky was blue, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Well, see, like, for instance, I'll give you an idea if I may share my story sure. real quick. It was when I was in outdoor <clears throat> school, and I was in the sixth grade. And so then this girl who was actually in another class but within the same school, there were multiple schools that were at this, so sort of a mutual friend came along and said, well, would you like to have a girlfriend because she kind of likes you? And I said, well, yeah, that would be kind of nice. It was kind of new back in the days when the Bay City Rollers were rehashing a Tommy <laughs> James hit, you know. So here we were going about through the week, you know, the magical time at outdoor school, for instance. And then all of a sudden on the last day, or actually it was the, the day before, you had the night dance, and then she decides she wants to break up with me. And I remember that I woke up the next morning and I started crying because I believed that she really loved me. Yep. You know. Now looking back on it now, it's puppy love, of course, but then it was real. Well. So man. then I get home. Think about this. And I'm taking the the bus all the way back, and then I get home, and somehow my parents just knew something was off, and so sent my stepdad out. You know, hey, you know, let's kind of talk about this. But I felt somehow embarrassed about wanting to talk about it, even though I was starting to cry anyway. Yep. And and he was actually very gentle. He wasn't like trying to do the, the so-called, oh, don't worry about it, there'll be this or that and the other. Right. He he tried in his own way the best he could to just try to let me let out whatever it was that was bothering me. But something, see, according to your book, yep. held me back from expressing the pain that I was feeling. Absolutely. And then... The human brain, which is a monstrous survival computer, okay, <laughs> it sends the message, oh, we do not want this repeated ever again. This was painful. Right. And so what happens is you go to, then you go out to get into your second little relationship, and you're holding back just a little bit emotionally. 
Mm-hmm. Well, if you hold back a little bit emotionally in an emotional relationship, it is doomed to fail from the beginning. Right. <laughs> and so now, now we have the second breakup, and we don't have any better tools for completing the second one than we had for completing the first one. So what we end up doing is using the wrong tools faster, wow. which, is, which is why we end up in a, in a country with a long-term marriage divorce rate of about 47% based on uh, nine-year-ago statistics in the census. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, and, and the sad part of all that is that nobody, I mean nobody, gets married in anticipation of getting a divorce. You know, everybody walks down the aisle or stands up in front of the just the peace and so forth, and 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 what they're looking for is a long-term, loving, supportive, nurturing, uh, safe relationship. But what happens is people, both people, are dragging unresolved past issues into that relationship, mm-hmm. and it's just it's pitiful. And uh, I mean, and again, we're talking about just a couple of the big ones, you know, death and divorce. Uh, mm-hmm. By number, by just gross number, the biggest loss in the in North America, well, in in the world actually, is the death of a pet. Uh, and and the interesting part there is is that where the pet is concerned, it's the closest you're ever going to come to an unconditional loving relationship. You know, I mean, you come home and and you've had the best day you ever had. And, you know, your dog wags its tail and licks your face. And then the next day you come home, it's the worst day you ever had. The dog, you know, wags its tail, licks your face, and, you know, that's it. Right. <clears throat> well, <laughs> when a pet dies, we go right back to the, oh, don't feel bad on Saturday, we'll get another pet. Right. Well, the problem is, while you can go out and get another four-legged furry creature, it will not be the same four-legged furry creature, (laughs) okay? Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is we need to learn how to grieve and complete the past relationship before we start the new one. And since we don't do that, uh, 66% of people who have a pet loss don't get another pet. Mm -hmm. And Because, again, their brain is saying, oh, that was very painful, that hurt, ooh, I don't want to repeat that. Uh, Just, I mean, that's just a typical example. Uh, the other the other loss that we never talk about, and in, in effect, the one that is sweeping the world right now, is loss of trust. Right. And it's mm-hmm. loss of trust in uh, our government. It's loss of trust in institutions. It's loss of trust in the bank. It's you know, and and what happens is is that people, rather than taking the action to process their own feelings, their own conflicting feelings caused by these changes. They store this energy. And so then you know absolutely that the percentage of domestic violence uh, issues are going to go up. Uh, The number of divorces are going to go up. The number of fender bender accidents are going to go up. And that is simply because the character trait most common to grief is a reduced ability to concentrate. And everybody listening is going to understand that one. I mean, (laughs) you will. We get. We get over a million hits every month on our website, and we get, my God, my phone bill is something like $10,000 a month for you know inbound 800 calls. And usually within the first two to three minutes, people are going to ask me in one way or another, am I losing my mind? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're not. It's just they, they're in this period of reduced ability to concentrate, and so they're, let's say they're standing in the bedroom, and they get this really great idea, and 12 seconds later they're standing in the middle of the kitchen, and they have no earthly idea you know, what they went there to get. Mm-hmm. And that's just common. And, and this is everything. Um, I can remember a few years ago after Hurricane Katrina, uh, we had a very famous uh, movie producer call up, and he said, listen, I have a friend at the Houston School District and could I buy and send down there 1,500 copies of the book When Children Grieve, which is a second book we wrote. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, well, yes, absolutely, if we can get the books distributed out to the teachers. You know, because the little children aren't going to leave their grief at the door <laughs> when they walk right. into the schoolroom. And so they're walking in the door with a reduced ability to concentrate, 
And while they might have been great students in New Orleans, all of a sudden in Houston, just three months later, they are terrible students. Right. And it has nothing to do with whether their, their uh, you know, cognitive ability. It has to do with the fact that their brain is preoccupied with something else, uh, you know, more painful. Mm-hmm. Another huge loss is moving. I mean, if you, it's almost, I, I hate to talk in absolutes because I don't believe in them, but if you show me a person who's moved more than two or three times by about age 15, I'll show you someone who is really hesitant to establish new friendships. And that's not, and that will continue on through their life until they figure out what's going on. You know, it's fascinating that you say that, John, because that's exactly how it was as I was growing up, is that I was more or less in a new school every year up until the sixth grade. And, again, as I was reading this book, you know, there are a lot of books out there, especially in the self-help realm, that teach you, you know, these secret steps to succeed or whatever it is. <laughs> and no matter how much I could read or dive into these things, they just weren't working for me. And so as I was reading the Grief Recovery Handbook, and of course we're about to talk about this here in a bit, about the myths of grieving, I started realizing a lot of things that were unresolved. Now, as you mentioned earlier, people go into a relationship and there's that baggage. It's funny how we're aware of the baggage, but nobody claims any responsibility for it. It's like it's been left in Pittsburgh when it should have been in Atlanta. (laughs) And I started really thinking about uh, what you were talking about. Now, to give you a real quick story, and then I'd like to to start talking about the myths that surround grieving so people get a clearer picture of what we're talking about, is there was a a girl that I used to work with who was dating a guy uh, that she worked with as well, then all of a sudden he decided he didn't want to be with her anymore and then ended up beginning to date the girl that he's married to now uh, who also worked there as well. So just imagine just how devastating that could be. You know, the guy that you work with, he's dumping you, but now he's moved on to somebody else that you also work with. So I, I thought that I would kind of reach my hand out to her and, 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 and kind of soothe her a little bit. I got her a nice little gift. And, and so we're sitting there and we're talking and – and you could just see that she feels really bad now. To talk about societal patterning, this is what I did. And I did this with compassion and earnestness, <laughs> but ignorance at the same time. Now, this is exactly what had happened. I said, I know that you feel terrible, but if this helps you, somewhere in the world somebody's having a tougher time than you are. Okay? <laughs> now, here's what happened the very next day, 9-11. Oh. Now, after, as I was reading your book yesterday, it's amazing how many different thoughts came to me about, about you know, the myths of grieving that I personally haven't resolved things, others haven't resolved things. But imagine the awesome power of me saying somewhere in the world somebody's having a tougher time than you, the 9-11 comes along, so her pain is not only not validated, but it's never right. expressed. Absolutely. And I just, I was saying to, to my wife, I said, what a jerk off I was, but I didn't mean to do that. But we do that so subconscious and unconsciously, no matter we're all nuts sometimes. Well, we do that unconsciously because when we're growing up, we observe it being done. Right. Uh, it's, it's just like, uh, it's the old concept of, well, compare losses in order to minimize emotional reaction. Right. And, and it's just like, you know, my mother saying, oh, don't feel bad on Saturday we get you another dog. Well, you know, I know exactly where she learned that because when I was a child, my grandmother was alive. Mm-hmm. And I was one of those fortunate kids that when I was really young, my great-grandmother was alive. So I know where my grandmother learned it. And it is this kind of, I, I don't even know how to best describe it. It's, it's a kind of generational pass-through from one generation to the next, of information. And the good news is that about 99% of the information that we learn is good. I mean, it is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is the 1% that is not fine is has such devastating consequences. Hey, you know, it's just incredible. Now, what I'd like to talk about is the myths of grieving by first starting with describing what grief actually is and what the authentic process is when it comes to grief? Well, in a a nutshell, 
it's kind of like scientifically okay. Grief is the conflicting feelings. What does that mean? Oh, positive and negative, happy and sad. Mm -hmm. The conflicting feelings caused by the end of, which would be the case of a death and so forth, or the change in any familiar patterns of behavior. Mm. So let's start with death as an example. Uh, two years ago, my mother died. She was 98 years old. And when the phone rang and they said, oh, well, your mother passed away this morning in her sleep and so forth, my very first feeling was relief. Now, that's a positive feeling caused by a death. Right. Now, about two seconds later, there was another feeling which was, oh, I'm going to miss her little sweet face. <clears throat> so, conflicting feelings caused by a death, okay? And that would be, that would also be the truth with, uh, you know, divorce and so forth. Oh, I'm happy the arguments are over. Oh, I may never find someone else, so forth. So, conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in any familiar pattern of behavior. So, you know... The next logical thought really is, oh, well, then we grieve for everything. And the answer is, yes, we do, but we don't want to look at it. The, um, I'm just trying to think of some other examples. Uh, uh, probably the best description, completely non-scientific, but, but it kind of, it, it's very clear. Following a death, grief is like the feeling of reaching out for someone who's always been there, only to find when you need them again, they're no longer there. So let's say uh, you've been married for 20 years, and your best friend is your wife, uh, and that's the person you talk to, then she dies. Now, the person you want to talk to the most, not there. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then, within 72 hours following a death, there are 141 comments that are so common uh, that they've almost achieved cliché status. And of these 141 things, 122 of them are not helpful to the experience of grieving. And yet, because we hear them growing up, our mouth comes open and we say the same kinds of things to people when we're confronted by you know, a death that happens to someone we know. Oh, don't feel bad. At least her suffering is over. You know, don't feel bad. He's in a better place. Uh, you know, oh, don't feel bad, there are plenty of fish in the sea, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. And, and notice that they all start with suppress sadness. They mm -hmm. all start with, oh, don't feel bad. And then they are followed by something that is intellectually accurate but emotionally useless. So it's almost like if grief were an intellectual experience, <laughs> all the things we say would really help. <laughs> but the, the problem is, and the last time I checked, uh, when I, I got started doing this because I had a son die. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you that when my son died, my brain was not broken. <laughs> so all the intellectual information that people gave me was of no value at all. It was my heart that was broken, mm -hmm. you see. And, and, and again, it, these kinds of comments come from everywhere. Uh, after my son died, the first person that said anything to me was a doctor, a medical doctor, a friend of mine. Uh, he's still a friend of mine. I have long since forgiven him for his ignorance. Mm -hmm. And the best thing he could come up with was, oh, John, don't feel bad. You should feel grateful. You and your wife can have other children. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I had to forgive him. He only had 27 years of formal education. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but that, see, that's another example. Uh, I was born and raised in downstate Illinois many years ago. And back then, in order to graduate from high school, you had to take a class on health and safety and first aid in order to graduate. So if somebody fell down and broke their arm, I mean, we're ready to roll. <laughs> you know, we're going to tear off a couple of table legs and get some belts, and we're going to make a splint. And, and now... Uh, I would actually call 911, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. But no place are we ever introduced to what do you do when someone's heart is broken? 
And so we move on to these pieces of incorrect information. Like the, the two we've been talking about are, you know, bury sadness and replace the loss. Right. But the, one of the huge ones, I mean, this one actually kills people, is the concept that grief just takes time. Uh, time heals all wounds, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you believe that, if you've ever been introduced to that, and you happen to accidentally believe it, you will use it. And I guarantee you there is no possibility of recovery from loss. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, well, here's, here's a good uh, kind of uh, metaphor. You walk outside of the studio today, and you notice that the left front tire of your car is flat. Okay? Now, would you just sit down on the curb and wait for air to get back in the tire? <laughs> I don't believe I would. <laughs> but but isn't that what we tell grievers? Exactly. <laughs> just sit here on the curb here, and pretty soon the tooth fairy is going to come along and somehow strike you happy again. Now, <clears throat> if you did have a flat tire, okay, while time was passing, you would be taking action. Mm-hmm. So the key is, oh, I'm going to be taking action within time. So both are required, time and action. And in the case of flat tire, you know, you'd open the trunk and, you know, get out the jack and do all that. Or you'd call the auto club, whatever. But you would take action because you know what action to take. But if you don't know what action to take, you're stuck with just time. Uh, One of the other ones that's... uh, that's just amazing is the concept of keep busy. Uh, Well, you know, you just have to keep busy. And the Move on. Well, that's the the other stuff. It's really great. Boy, don't we feel heroic with our cliches. (laughs) Oh, you you have to let go and move on. Uh And then then the question becomes, well, let go of what and move on to where? Or all the people who run around saying things like, oh, you have to do the grief process. Oh, well, what is that? Well, excuse me, I have to go to Starbucks. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> knows. You know, uh, they use people will use, and this is the professional community as well because they don't mm-hmm. get any education in this area either. They will drag out Elizabeth Kubler Ross's stages of dying, mm-hmm. which they don't even know are are the stages of dying. Right. <laughs> because that's what I really enjoy. Yeah, if I may, is that you mentioned that, and I thought, you know. He's right, but then you show consistently after working with people for 30 years that that's really not, it's related, but it's kind of unrelated at the same time, that there are different things, and that's where you got into the societal patterning. Well, people are always, you know, it's interesting, people are always interested in little categories or little boxes or little mm-hmm. stages or little steps or whatever. So uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a stage of all grief, okay? Here it is. Every relationship is unique, Mm -hmm. period. Therefore, every griever is unique. Therefore, every loss is unique. Therefore, every recovery is unique. And, but that just, (laughs) you know, that just drives people crazy because they want little pockets, little, you know, oh, he's a conservative, oh, he's a liberal, oh, she's a, you know, I mean, we want these little 30-second soundbite things, and and where grief is concerned, uh, that doesn't apply. I mean, even if you had, and we have had hundreds of sets of twins who have been in seminars or been in outreach programs or that kind of thing, who, you know, let's say mom died. Well, they are both not incomplete emotionally about the same things. Each relationship is absolutely unique. Uh, do you have children? I do. Actually, they're closer to young adults now. So, But they're not the same, are they? No, not at all. They have little different personalities and little different interests and little different you know, emotional reactions to things, and yet we're going to try, somehow try to make them all the same. Well, it just mm-hmm. that won't work. Mm-hmm. The from from the first of all, let me throw in uh, for anybody listening who needs or wants more information. If they just go to our website, which is www.grief.net, up at the very top on the homepage, there's a little button up there that says helpful articles, 
and we keep about 60 articles up there all the time. And every couple of months, we kind of refresh them and put up others because we have hundreds of these articles that, you know, that we've written over 31 years. Uh, and there's a wealth of information there. It's all free. You know, download it. Do you know? Do whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have questions or if you're uh, you know, want some more information, they can call us at 818-907-9600 if they're rich. <laughs> if they're poor, <laughs> if they're poor, they can call us at 800-334-7606. Uh, and that's, uh, we ha and don't, and then don't call me later and say I couldn't get through. It's a 10-line inbound rotor system. <laughs> okay, you, you can't not get through. Okay. Good. Uh, we do uh, well, ex like 9/11 as an example. By the late afternoon of 9/11 and 9/12, we were our, we were overwhelmed. Our servers and uh, we and we tend, you know, it's like we we tend to look at that as a United States issue. But the truth of the matter is, there were people who died at the World Trade Center from 91 countries. And we have heard from all of them. <clears throat> we have uh, we have offices here in the U.S. We have offices in Canada. We have offices in Scandinavia. Uh, my partner right now, as a matter of fact, is in London, England, because we'll be opening an office there probably by the end of this year, if you know, God willing, and the creek don't rise. You know, uh, the handbook that we're talking about has been translated into 13 languages. It's it's kind of like the Bible. Of mm -hmm. recovery from loss, uh, it's it, one of the things that uh, and I got to give Harper Collins some props here. Uh, they have put two copies of that book uh, in every public library in the United States. So if money's an issue, go to the library. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to you go in and ask for the Grief Recovery Handbook, and then it'll be on the long checkout list. I mean, normally you can check a book out for two weeks, but this book you can check out for six weeks because we actually want you to do the work <laughs> that, that is laid out in the book mm -hmm. because that's where, uh, that's where the recovery comes. It's from identifying all the things that I wish I would have done differently, identifying all the things I wish I would have done better. Uh, example. I had a younger brother who died in 1969. Now, this I'm a Vietnam veteran, so close relationships at that point in my life were not easy. Uh, I loved my brother. I was proud of my brother. He was the only person on earth that I trusted. Now, you don't suppose I ever told him any of that, do you? No. <laughs> so what I did is I did what I had been trained to do. In my home, my parents actually used to say things like, oh, don't tell people how you feel, show them, which meant literally buy them stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Right. So <clears throat> here's my brother. He's a scholarship pole vaulter at Southern Illinois University, and he's poor. You know, students are poor. Okay. So I would show him that I loved him and I was proud of him by sending him money. Well, uh, one afternoon the phone rang, and it's my mother saying, oh, your brother died. Now, the first thing is numb. Remember, there's that numb thing. Sure there is. Which lasts a different period of time for each person, by the way. And then the next thing that happens, and it is normal, you can't stop it, is that's where people begin to review the relationship. And that's where they first start to identify the things that are emotionally unfinished. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> what do you suppose I would have given to be able to just turn the clock back five minutes and call him up and tell him how much I loved him and how proud of him I was. Mm -hmm. I'd have been willing to give anything. But I didn't know at the time. You know, 1969, I didn't know what I know now. I'm thinking and reviewing about what you're saying. For those of us just joining us, we're talking with John W. James, author of The Grief Recovery Handbook. And what came to mind for me, John, is, as you were talking about the death of your brother, is that as we begin to review relationships, 
uh, especially if they die or they leave whatever, about the things that you, you would have done different or better. And then the word guilt comes along. And I know that even in myself, and I think a lot of people feel guilt and sometimes regret. <laughs> and okay. But, you know, you can't really do much about those things, but there must be actions you can take that help you overcome that. And my question, I guess, is, is as people begin to do the work that needs to be done on whatever it is they want to do work on, you know, how does that change them in their life? Because as I was mentioning earlier in the program, when you have unresolved grief that can set up blocks that sets the tone for actions that sometimes you unconsciously make that truly affect your life. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's it's really interesting. Uh, Which is the most sense I've ever heard, if you want to call this the self-help realm, that I've heard, and probably period. Well, it's interesting. We uh, When the 20th anniversary edition came out, we immediately went to number one in the grief section and the bereavement section. And I think we made it all the way up to number 17 in the big, giant, total self-help thing. And you know what was really interesting? Kind of, let me digress here a minute. Uh, I get a phone call from my agent. She said, oh, you're number 17 on the Kindle download list. <laughs> I don't even own one of those yet, but I looked at them. Uh, Anyway, the where that word guilt, you used two words. You said guilt or regret. Now, I'll let you use regret, but I'm not going to let you use guilt because it never defines what a griever is feeling. And as a matter of fact, this has, was such a problem that in 19, 1988, I think it was, we actually went out and studied this. And it is never the griever who uses that word first. The griever who's in the most vulnerable moment in their life, who are who you know they're just completely vulnerable, they will verbalize, "Oh, I wish I had told him one more time I loved him." And then some well-meaning, well-intentioned person will say, "Oh, you shouldn't feel guilty." And so after proving that we started attacking that word. Uh, guilt is the result of a deliberate and intentional action. I mean, mm -hmm. I think you should use that word if you're on jury duty or you know whatever, but generally speaking, uh, it has nothing whatsoever to do with grief. Right. The other kind of great human pastime is we tend to beat ourselves up about what we didn't know when we didn't know it. Now you Isn't got, that the truth? You, you've got to follow that <laughs> sentence, okay? We, we tend we tend to get the whip out and beat ourselves over the back about what we didn't know when we didn't know it. Listen, trust me, if I had known how important it was to to express verbally my emotions to my younger brother, if I had known that in 1968, trust me, I would have done it, <laughs> okay? So that in 1969, when he died, I wouldn't have all of this stuff left in my stomach. Oh, I wish I had done this. I wish I had said that. But I didn't know it in 1968. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things where we have to learn to stop talking in emotional shorthand. Mm -hmm. you, you follow what I'm saying? I mean, uh, I mean this can be something as simple as, as I have a friend of mine, he's a much, much older guy, and I have watched him live his life with integrity. If, if he gives his word, he keeps his word, okay? And I, when I was younger, I watched this guy. I tried to emulate him. I had conversations with him. And then one day, about six years ago, I thought, you know what? I've never told him. <laughs> so I called him up and said, listen, I need to have coffee with you for about ten minutes. And so we sit down, we're having coffee, and I said, listen, the reason we're here is, is that I just want to tell you that I appreciate who you are, and I want to acknowledge that I've kind of used you as a role model, and I just want to thank you for being who, I, who you are. Mm -hmm. Now, he was from a much older generation where uh, conversation about feelings is, is like avoiding cooties. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sure this made him a little uncomfortable. Okay, 
But when the day comes when he dies, I'm not going to be sitting around thinking, gosh, I wish I'd have told him how important he was and and uh, and thank him for just being who he was. Mm-hmm. You know, just little simple things like this. Um, gosh, uh, all of the things that people feel unfinished about are going to fall in one of six categories. It's going to be an apology I need to make. It's going to be a forgiveness I need to give. It's going to be an emotional, uh, important comment like I love you or I was proud of you or whatever. Or it may fall into the category of unrealized hopes, dreams, and expectations. Mm-hmm. Like uh, my son, when my son died, he was three days old. But my emotional relationship with my son was about seven months long. <laughs> okay. Right. I mean, women, first of all, they know when they're pregnant way before Dr. Bob tells them, you know. And immediately, they start creating hope streams and expectations. Sure they do. And for men, uh, sorry all you guy listeners, uh, for men, we lie. <clears throat> uh, that's where your you know, wife puts your hand on her stomach and says, oh, can't you feel that moving? And you go, oh, sure, honey. Uh, But then one fine day, boom, you do feel it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where the relationship, the emotional relationship for men begins. You know, and I'm right away, I'm going to be teaching him Little League Baseball, and I'm going to be taking him fishing, and, you know, all this stuff. And I already had him in college, (laughs) in my my mind, you know. Right. Oh, I'm going to be a great parent. Well, when the child dies... Do you have emotional content now that is unrealizable because someone died? And the answer is yes. And that has to be identified. It has to be expressed. There's a whole system in that book. And we've been studied three different times by three different research universities. And the result is, oh, we are 100% successful with willing participants. And you can't get any better than that. And the truth is we don't fix grievers because grievers aren't broken. What we do is we give them information that they do not have, and then we try to create an emotionally safe atmosphere for them to use it. Remember, they have to be taking actions within time in order to grieve and complete whatever loss it is that brings them to the book or to the institute or anything like that. You know, it's interesting when you bring that up, and I reflect on uh, the book, uh, uh, the Grief Recovery Handbook, and that is that you can go back so far in your life and realize just, you know, as you read the first 30 or 40 pages, it just was amazing to me personally how many things I reflect on that I, I, I can look back and go, you know, that really wasn't resolved, or yes, I did hear those cliches and how that patterning you know, got me to a point that no matter how much a person may desire success or a different way of life, that that won't matter until you recover from those things. And it's what's amazing about this is its simplicity. Now, I don't know how hard the work is yet because I haven't gotten that far, but the point is, is it has that simplicity. Now, uh, one of the statements that you made in your book, and it was just interesting uh, that my own wife had been talking with an astrologer and apparently she decided to talk about me and she says i sense that daniel is taking a look at his life and that he's feeling tremendous regret because it didn't turn out the way he had hoped it had and there's that feeling of hopelessness Mm -hmm. And, and i was thinking you know that's amazing she would say that because i've been thinking about that a lot actually right you know over the last say six or eight months or even a year or more and and that is that I did want something different, and here's what it is, but it's like, what is it that's holding me back? No matter how much self-help or coaching or whatever it is, something just felt like it was holding me back. And as I was reading your book, I thought, you know, I never thought about it this way before. Yeah, that's, and yeah, I'll tell you what it is. If you take an old-school blackboard, mm-hmm. and there's a bunch of chalk on it, if you just use the eraser, <laughs> it isn't clean. Mm-hmm. So the self-help books, the coaching, the this and that, and the other thing will help you erase chalk. But until you get out the wet rag and clean underneath, there's no possibility of progress. Mm-hmm. And and again, I don't want to I don't want to 
give the idea that unresolved grief is you know hiding under every rock that there is because that's not true mm-hmm. but it's like um one of the unresolved losses in my life when I was much younger made it very difficult for me to trust older adult male authority figures. Mm-hmm. And then I can't figure out why I'm having a hard time working because I'm constantly in conflict with my boss, who was an older adult male authority figure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Oh, you mean there's a connection there? Yes, there is. It's like, it's like. Uh, do we have time, by the way? Uh, we have about ten minutes, actually. Okay. Um, let's say the first girlfriend that broke up with me, my little head says, oh, she's not trustworthy. Well, if it just stayed there, that'd be enough, okay? But it doesn't stay there because the survival computer is busy trying to eliminate even the potential of another painful experience. So... You know, the girlfriend breaks up with me, and then I, of course, swore off girls forever, which lasted, I think, two weeks. Yeah, my mother actually made a bet with me after my incident, and I bet that I wouldn't date a girl until I was 18 for 100 bucks. (laughs) (laughs) But what happened was kind of like this. Oh, the first girlfriend isn't trustworthy. And then a couple days later, my head pipes up with, well, you know, if she's not trustworthy, then probably all of her girlfriends aren't trustworthy. Mm Mm-hmm. And then a couple of days, oh, well, then if she's not trustworthy and her girlfriends aren't trustworthy, then all of their girlfriends aren't trustworthy. You know, and in no short order, I could make 50% of the population of the planet untrustworthy, and I hadn't even met them yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is a little unfair, <laughs> okay, to me and them. But that's kind of how the the protective... Uh, nature of the survival computer works, okay? Um, Gosh, I mean, I could sit here and just tell you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories. But the truth of the matter is, is that anybody who picks up that book and reads the first, like, four chapters, they're going to be sitting there going, oh, yeah, me too. Right. Because it's absolutely, you know, when I first started doing this, I thought it was a U.S. problem. And then I was invited to go do a training seminar in Canada in 1983. And, they, oh, my gosh, they, it was the same thing. And I thought, well, this must be an English-speaking Western culture problem. And then I went to Japan. And then I went to Europe. And then I went to South America. And then I went to, you know, and what, now we're all over the world. And the truth of the matter is, is those six pieces of misinformation that we talk about in the book, are universally believed, I don't care where the plane lands. Right. Uh, And then there's, you know, probably, well, one of the other terrible things that we teach people is that other people or other events are 100% responsible for our emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is, is that if you believe a loss is 100% responsible for your sadness then the only thing that can end your sadness is for the event to not have happened. And that's not going to work. I mean, the, I've only seen the Earth spin backwards once and time go backwards, and that was in the movie Superman 2. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's going to happen for any of our listeners here, right? <clears throat> and so what we have to do is we have to get the correct answer to the question you know, what ruins the picnic? Is it the rain or your attitude about the rain? Mm-hmm. And the answer is both. <laughs> okay? And most people will pick one or the other, which just proves that we've been brainwashed to believe that it's either or. Right. And it isn't. It's never either or. You know, it's it's not as black and white as, you know, the evening news would try to tell us. It's gray. It's always gray. And then my job is to acquire knowledge use the knowledge to identify emotional content that's stopping me from becoming the person I'm supposed to be, and then using that knowledge or that information to kind of unload the the little wagon that I've been dragging around with me for most of my life so that I can get on and, and, and be happy. And And it's not that hard. Now, once you have actually done the steps that are in that book the first time, and the first time there will be a lot of questions and so forth because that's true about anything new, 
mm-hmm. you're going to experience an enormous sense of relief. And then you're going to go, aha, this is easy. I mean, this is like, let's go back to the room. I got a hammer, I got a saw. I'm supposed to paint the room blue. And all of a sudden, somebody comes along and introduces you to paint rollers and paint brushes. Now, all of a sudden, it's a whole lot easier to paint that wall. You see? And mm-hmm. that's what this book does. It gives you the set of tools you know, that somebody probably should have given, given you in grade six. <laughs> that would be expecting way too much. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, I just kind of think, too, you know, as you've worked with people over the 30 years that you've worked with them, uh, what kind of life transformations have they experienced uh, as they were able to do this? I guess, well, it's grief recovery, but it's also sort of a grief cleansing, if you will. Yeah, you could you could say that. Mm-hmm. And And in response, what I would say is I have two four-drawer file cabinets here filled with letters. And that's just the letters. Oh, and they always get it wrong. People always get it wrong. They send me a letter, oh, you saved my life. No, I didn't. I gave you some information. (laughs) Okay? Right. Now, I'll take my 5% responsibility. But you're the one who did the work. Mm -hmm. And you've got to take your 95% responsibility. You You have done something that is courageous, meaning... First, the first thing that you've done is acknowledged that there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. Most people never even get to that point, you know. And then you've gone and said, which is oh, part of Mary Kubler Ross's denial. <laughs> well, exactly, and, and 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 that's really understandable if it's a terminal illness we're talking about. Sure. I mean, Elizabeth and I were friends for 25 years, mm-hmm. and it, most people never even read her book on death and dying, but they quote from it <laughs> incorrectly. In her second book, in the acknowledgments at the front end of the book, she says, and this is a quote, you will notice there is no chapter in this book on grief. Mm -hmm. I am not qualified to talk about that subject. There There are others who are far more qualified than I. And yet, since nobody reads the book and they just pass out... uh, Xerox copies of selected sections. Nobody even knows this stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. there again, if you go to the website, uh, over on the right-hand side, there's a little section about uh, the the stages of grief and kind of uh, taking a real look at them. Um, that it's a reprint from an article that was in, I think, Scientific American last month or two months ago, whenever it was. Um, and people can go, oh my gosh. I've been running around with half truth and misinformation my whole life. Well, of course it didn't. Work. You know, things can't work if you're using the wrong tool. Right. Just can't. It's like uh, now that I have you on the phone too, I'm going to lobby here. Every year around November, we become very popular <laughs> on <laughs> grief over the holidays. So uh, be sure to call us back because we want to get on the phone around sometime before Thanksgiving and help people to kind of survive another year of the holidays. Quite fascinating. Again, like I said, uh, uh, we have covered grief on our program, how to recover from grief, but it was always pretty consistent with with dying and death. And usually it was involved with, for instance, how a widow got through her year, two or three years, uh, the experiences that she had, or it could have been a widower. But this was the first time that I had seen or picked up a book about grief that actually had to do with loss almost uh, without trying to whitewash it, but as a general topic of loss because as you take a look at this, at the fact that we all lose something, that it's quite amazing that when you understand that, you go, hey, and then now I've got the tools that I can kind of take care of business here. Just to give you a quick example, uh, just as we're getting ready to close out, you know, with these economic times, look at how many bankruptcies and foreclosures are going on and divorces that are going on. Everybody is losing something that they had worked hard for, but then they have the shame that carries the fact that they weren't successful because they've lost that gain. Now, a hero's journey, uh, 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 the the journey of courage would be, just as you mentioned earlier, is to recognize there is a problem and then find the right tools for the solution. You get back up, yes, I became bankrupt, dust it off. Now, how can I change this? 
You know, the same thing with if you lose a house or you lose a spouse, for instance, through divorce. And and those are just those things. And when you look at grief in that perspective, it's amazing that a book such as the Grief Recovery Handbook can actually help you in so many aspects. It's just quite amazing. And the only thing I can say is it's a, it's a pleasure to know some, that, that you, along with uh, Russell out there, have been doing this and have actually shifted that paradigm to giving people the right information. Absolutely, and I appreciate the compliment. And go ahead and give your uh, website out again, uh, John, real quick, and and a couple of phone numbers real quick. Uh, Mm -hmm. www.grief.net, and then uh, 818-907-9600 or 800-334-7606. And we have a MySpace page and a Facebook thing and a Twitter thing <laughs> and all that other stuff. Uh, Twitter, really interesting. Uh, the woman, I, it was a husband and wife, but anyway, the woman who was involved in the starting Twitter was in a seminar recently. Mm-hmm. So we have a great presence on Twitter. <laughs> oh, well, great. Of course, we don't check it, but <laughs> that's because we're old. <laughs> okay. Again, the book is The Grief Recovery Handbook, and our guest today on the Beyond 50 radio program, John W. James. And again, it's been a pleasure, and I'd like to reconsider uh, revisiting you again. Absolutely, my friend. Okay, thank you again very much. It's been very liberating. And I also want to thank you, the listeners out there. Be sure to visit the website he was suggesting, and if you didn't quite get that down, be sure to go ahead and visit us at our website, and that is at beyond 50 radio.com that's the number 50 with a five zero sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter and also visit us at our blog as well we also welcome your questions or comments and if you have any show ideas for us please be sure to send us an email daniel at beyond 50 radio.com or you can say beyond 50 at beyond 50 radio.com we keep it pretty simple here and that's the number 50 with a five zero Again, thank you for tuning in. You have been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past halfway.